Hey guys, welcome to Cricket Fanatics Magazine. This is your daily show. I'm your host, Khalil Mahirin. This is Makao Saditya. And today we have an excellent episode for you on the daily show. Now we've brought two guests. We've got Kyle with us and we've got Seppo with us. Both Western Province Blitz um, players. It's very difficult for me to think about it constantly because I've been calling it the Cobras for so long. So now there's a new name in town and I have to think about it constantly and make sure that I call you guys the right, by the right name. So... To satisfy your sponsors, I'm going to have to say Six Gun Grill, Western Province, and that's the way I'm going to do it today. Um, welcome to the show, guys. Um, how are you guys feeling? Obviously, the, your your first round of fixtures finished in the, in the in the T20 knockout. How are you guys feeling? Yeah, feeling pretty good. <clears throat> we had a pretty good weekend out there, and um, the three games together pretty nicely. Um, obviously, our wins was always quite weather affected. We don't get outside quite late on in this season so we you know it's good to get out there and play a competitive game um, three of them uh, which you know all went down to the wire seemingly so um yeah it was a great experience great first weekend out and kyle for you i mean when you look at the the stats etc and i mean you i wouldn't say new to the t20 game but um more re- you're getting more regular games in t20 cricket now than you than you did before uh, obviously there was an opportunity to for you to play the regional global t20 when it was initially and then obviously that was cancelled because we know how good you are in the in the first class cricket i mean we've seen your stats in semi pro cricket bat and ball what has it been like settling in um in, into this new team now again and and getting your Getting your finding your space within this team and in this team environment. I think for for, for me it was a case of I, I kind of fell out the way of it. Um, I, I think like you mentioned that global league happened. I think it was 2017. I think it should have been, and that was kind of my stepping stone to, to kind of get onto the main stage. And then for the last couple of years I've just fallen a bit. So with this new domestic restructure. I think it's kind of given guys like me and there's a lot of other guys around the country that this new sort of setup gives you new opportunities to, I mean, the cricket's going to T20 cricket around the world. Um, it is something that as a player, you probably need to to be good at or find a way into it. Um, so I think it helps with this new domestic restructure and, and moving back to Cape Town um, is something that I would definitely um, would take with both arms. And um, I've been excited to join the group. I've been back for about a month. UK. So just being back to the team and you have to find your feet pretty quickly. Um, but yo, like people said, we had a, a pretty good weekend and I mean, it's exciting cricket. So looking forward to what's to come. Uh, you know, both of you all have, um, have significant first class experience as well, you know, and I was, I was wondering that uh, looking at, looking at global trends, most players who've succeeded in T20 cricket, have played a considerable amount of long form cricket. And I was wondering how that might have influenced your game or perhaps helped you uh, discover yourselves more as cricketers. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a very good point. Um, I think for the more first class cricket you play, the more I think you learn about yourself um, as a cricketer, your strengths, your weaknesses, um, and just the length of the game it lends itself to you being in the field for a long period of time. But as a bowler, uh, you bowl loads and loads of overs. So you tend to figure things out about yourself that coaches sometimes can't even coach uh, into you. And so I think that's played a, a significant role in, in the success I've had so far in T20 cricket, in, in just knowing and being quite street smart, street smart as to what is required in specific moments as a bowler. And yeah, I think it's, it's helped a lot in, and just getting my head around the thinking around the game broadly, not just in, in any format uh, specifically. Uh, I think for me, it's, it, that what T20 has shown is that you have to express yourself. So in whichever way you can do that. Uh, and you don't really see it too much in first class cricket, but a lot of the guys that probably make it that first or second season of theirs is probably their best season because no one really knows what they're about and what they can, can offer. And I think that helps with the T20 cricket because you can just express yourself. I think what we spoke about this weekend was playing the uh, positive option. So whatever you're going to do, batting, bowling, fielding, you're going to take the positive option. And and I think it paid off this weekend. And yeah, definitely, definitely helps us as players just express your game 
everyone's a bit different to to the other guy next to you, and that's what I think makes us makes us work well. How does how does that um, affect your your fitness routines? Because long form cricket obviously places more of an emphasis on uh, on endurance to ensure that you you're ready for five days. Whereas T20 cricket is a bit more explosive in that sense. You know, recently there was a statistic where a batsman in the IPL who made two runs had clocked about 15 kilometers through the course of a game. So that to me was a staggering statistic. So I was just wondering how you guys cope with that sort of thing. Um, I think from a from a fast bowler's point of view, I think it's, uh, it's, it's <clears throat> the difficulty. The difficulty is different in that um, in T Twenty cricket, you're required to be explosive, and it's a you work at a pretty high clip for a shorter amount of time, which I think can be more difficult sometimes. And you know, as far as you know, just getting knackered and stuff, and and obviously we're playing Kimberley and. 35 degrees every day, it doesn't make it easier. Um, and in four-day cricket, I think it's it's more, like you say, endurance rather than speed and explosion. Um, and you can sort of ease your way into a game uh, physically, I think. Whereas in C3 cricket, from ball one, it's, it's on. And, you know, if you're also a decent fielder or you're quick around the boundary and you're a bowler as well, you're expected to, after you've bowled, go to long on or cover sweep or do square. You know, where the ball is, is going a lot and it's a high traffic area, so there's not much... Of a rest you get even off the ball um, as a player, which is which is fun, and I think it's um, probably why we do so much uh, fitness preseason um, for those sort of moments and ensure that we can execute under pressure when you're tired at the end of the game um, and games on the line. So yeah, it's I find it more difficult physically to be honest. You doing um, uh, four day cricket, especially. With there being only four overs, one of the things probably less taxing on the body. I find it sometimes the other way around, where four days I find it a little bit easier than T20 physically. I think for me, the, the way we train is, is is quite crucial. We don't, we're not going to spend four or five hours in the net. Um, the way that we warm up, we go about our fielding routines and everything. Is you have to be ready for ball one. So we get into the nets. You'll probably, as bowlers, you'll have a couple minutes to mark out your run ups and stuff like that. But from ball one, the batsmen are probably running at you or trying to put you under pressure or or, or doing something that's going to simulate the game sort of situation. Uh, there's no kind of easing into it. Uh, I think we want to make our practice sessions just as intense, if not more intense than games, because you walk out to the middle, there's enough added pressure from um, TV or whatever that's going on. Or if, like for Sunday, we had to must win um, within a certain amount of overs. So that's added pressure. So it's, it's hard to simulate in a, in a training session, but we do make our training sessions as intense as we can. I think that's what probably gets us ready. And the bowlers might not be bowling 10 overs at a time in a day, but the six overs that they do bowl is six high-quality overs. So from the both of you, uh, what I like about this particular interview is that we're going to get two completely different outlooks of the game of T20 cricket. Ultimately, we'll be able to get a holistic view of everything. And that's what I like about this right now. So that's why I want to ask you, and uh, maybe the one is for Tsepo and the, the next one can be for Kyle, but um, I want to ask you about the... Obviously, Tsepo, you've been to quite a few different teams and you've, you've experienced it differently. And you you were also a part of that that Paul, Paul Rocks team as well, knowing about that. I mean, what was the chats behind the scenes with regards to them leading up to that winning that tournament because we want to know more about the mentality going into a tournament you know it's a different type of preparation if it's a once of t20 game or you know you're going to play a series where if you know that you're going to play in a tournament where you, there's knockouts happening every single match is important you need to get points on the board i want to know the strategies going into a t20 game as a bowler specifically i mean Seppo, you've you've learned how to but open the bowling, bowl middle overs as well as in the death, and and you've done all of those quite successfully in your career, no matter where you've gone. So from that perspective, and then Carl, from your perspective, that big hitting role we always talk about, you know, as an all rounder, you you got a bat in that six and a number seven in the number eight role. Maybe sometimes you have to move up the order. Uh, just the mentality going into that when you know you have to take your team over that 
that boundary, you know, to get yourself into that into that section or that amount of runs on the board that you need to either set a total that is unreachable or to chase when you have that couple of we have 46 that you need or 30 or 20 balls or something like that. So I just want to know about the mentality, what the coaches tell you, what 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 experience you've had from coaches when you're building a strategy for a tournament like as big as what you are playing now. Um, <clears throat> I'll go first. I think for me, in terms of coaches and, and captains. Um, that I've worked with in the past, especially in the teams that have been successful. Um, as a bowler, it's as we know, you're under the pump quite often. Um, play good wickets, sure. it is a bad game, <laughs> you know. And so, I think they encourage, and I think Faf Dubasi at Bar Rocks and Pani this last weekend, and other captains I've had, um, encourage bowlers to be brave. Um, you've got to go out there and try and get wickets. Um, that's the only way you can really stem the flow of runs more often than not is to go out there and, and try and get people out. Um, I, I think it's gone other days where you go out there and you sort of at the hit and give and hope for the best and you try and sort of defend and defend and defend. You know, the batters have gotten too good. They play way too many shots. Um, they've got a lot of options. So I think the through line for a lot of the teams that I've played for in terms of leadership uh, from coaching staff to, to captains as well has been to go out there and try and get people out. Um, and that's a death as well. Um, you know, you try more often than not, you know, if you're going to bowl Yorkers, you bowl for the stunts. You know, you want to make sure that if he misses that ball, it's out. Um, and that's the best way to sort of keep the flow of runs down as, as well as get teams to manageable totals to chase um, from a bowling point of view. Um, and yeah, that's just, I think, for the most part, where the generic message would be. And then obviously the specific messages for specific grounds. Um, in terms of expectations, you play in Paul, for instance, the wickets are a little slower, uh, a lot of change ups, or whatever the case is, as opposed to playing in the Ponderers, or whatever the case is, where you know there's not a lot of space for change ups, you've got to go in the hole. Um, and it's sort of places like Kimberley this last weekend, where um, you know the first day the wicket was unbelievable. <laughs> um, and as you know, the, the weekend went on, you know, it got hotter and hotter, and the wicket sort of started to get a little more tired and it brought a lot of spin into the game and a lot of change ups as well. So from Friday to Sunday even the game plan changed. And you know on Friday we you know hitting hard lengths, bowling Yorkers because the wicket's so good. And by Sunday it's your stock ball pretty much is a cutter. And the change up is on pace or a Yorker for instance. So I think having and being lucky enough to play with guys who are experienced enough to go, okay, the wicket's changing, the conditions are changing, this is what we're going to do better in the game. Um, Helps a hell of a lot as well. Come finish it. <laughs> <laughs> One inning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I'm I'm going to talk mainly based on this last probably month with, with Western Province. Um, we haven't probably once said that we either a chasing team or, or a setting team. I think we set on Friday, we scored nearly 200 runs and we were able to defend it. It was a good game of cricket. Um, and then on Sunday, when we needed to chase, we chased. So I think. Something that our, our squad probably has quite nicely is that we've got that we can do both or we're happy to do both. Um, and then we've got a captain that is happy to speak to the senior guys on the team. He's, he doesn't go about it his own way. He, I think he uses a few of the guys in the squad as, along with management. Um, and whatever needs to be done in the day, that's what we, we kind of do. So, And I think you need to train for that. You, you can't just train, okay, we're just going to set. Because then if you lose the toss and, you, and now you have to chase and you you're not sure how to go about it. There's, there's scoreboard pressure, there's stuff like that. Um, we do have a few youngsters in our team, uh, myself included, who hasn't played a lot of T20 cricket. But it just it helps um, having the senior guys. And like Tep says, Pawnee is, is quite massive. Um, just in backing backing every single player on the team. Um, and yeah, it's T20 cricket, you never know what's going to happen. From one over to the next, it's, it's not even over by over, it's ball by ball. Um, and a misfield can change the game. A drop catch can change the game. So we kind of tell ourselves, you you watch the scoreboard, um, just tell you how to go about it. But at the end of the day, at the top of your mark, you need to bowl what you need to bowl and you need to execute your plan. And sometimes it's your day and sometimes it's not. So that, but that's, yeah, that's T20 cricket that happens. You know, these days with the evolution of, of T20 cricket, Team composition has become uh, quite an interesting debate because in an ideal scenario, 
teams are looking to to have at least six or seven bowling options, but they're looking to bat to at least nine or ten. And what's what's your view on that? Uh, you know, do you see that being um, a trend in in South Africa as well? And um, how how do you approach that? You know, because it feels like you know more people are going to have to do both roles. Yes, yes, Chepo. Yeah, thank you. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what is that one, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it, it's a difficult one for me um, because obviously I'm a bowler, um, but I think a lot of the time people look. Most teams are now made up in the image of the, that English team um, in the way they are. You know, uh, as you say, composition. They bet all the way down to probably ten um, with either Adil Rashid or someone like Jordan. that, you know, Jordan batting at nine and 10. Um, but I mean, they, they are spoiled for choice in terms of all-rounders. I think not everybody has that opportunity in terms of just the quality of personnel. Um, I think for the most part though, I think there is room for specialists. I think it's good that there are guys, there are teams that, that load their team with all-rounders, but oftentimes you don't quite get the perfect all-rounder. There aren't many hard pandyas like, walking around. so. It's, for instance, it's, it's, you're always going to have someone who's batting heavy or bowling heavy. He's probably a, more of a bowling all-rounder or a batting all-rounder. And so I think for me, um, if you've got guys who can execute their skill to a very high level, the likes of in the past Umar Gu or Lassit Malinga or whatever the case was, guys who are really, really good at, that, at their skill, I think there's still place in the game for guys who are specialists in that way. Um, and I think, you know, I'd like to look at myself and say that I'm, I'm trying to be that sort of a bowler who can, who can do multiple things. And so you can help the team in multiple ways. If you're required to bowl on the power play, middle overs or at the death, depending on what the team needs on the day, um, it's as, almost as, as valuable as having an all-rounder, I think. Somebody who is pretty competent at bowling at any part of the game, the T20 game, is as useful as having somebody who can do both skills. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree with Tef says that I think having a bowler, for example, who can bowl up front and the middle order and at the death, even 50 over cricket is, is a big thing. We, we spoke about it the other day in terms of we used, I think it was Liam Plunkett and the way they used him for the World Cup. He only bowled in the middle overs and he did a really good job and it, and it worked. And um, maybe that's something that we need to speak about at, at Western Province for our quarterfinals is maybe just fine tuning more of where we need to be. I mean, this is our first outing. Um, in quite a while. We would only been outdoors for a, probably two weeks max. Um, so we still have a lot of fine tuning to do. And that's why it's, it's probably quite nice that we were in the first pool because we've got a bit of time now to, to, to get that fine tuning, to find that composition that, like you spoke about. Um, who needs to bat where? I think our batters show that we can be quite flexible in the middle order. Um, I think if you look at our, our dugout there, everyone's padded up from number three all the way to number eight. And, Whoever we feel like needs to go in, can go in. And I think that's where we are lucky because we do have that all-round option. Um, we've got probably seven bowling options on the day with whatever 11 we go with, which, which does help. But I think there are definitely still specialists. You need a specialist opening batter who, who knows what to do with pace on the ball. But now opening batters need to be able to play for spin because spin has now become a big thing in the power play. So that's something that our opening batters are also quite good at. So that's a special that's a special skill. Opening the batting, whether it's Test cricket or one day cricket or T20 cricket, is a special skill. Um, and we we are quite lucky with the middle order we have. It's quite flexible. We can go left hand, right hand, and that's how we've gone about it. But you still need a guy at the death to bowl six Yorkers. He you can't have an all rounder who's more focused on batting. It's just unfair to him to bowl six Yorkers at the death. You probably need a fast bowler who's that's his job. Um, so composition is important, and all-rounders are definitely a massive thing in, in T20 cricket. But like Teppo says, I think that specialization is also is also key. Uh, and can I add something to that as well before we move on? Um, just I was just thinking about our team um, specifically. Um, and I, I think in our team, we probably have two batters who don't bowl and two bowlers who don't really, really bat. Um, He's one of them. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, oh, and um, and probably myself and Andre Berger and Tom, you've got Tony and um, and Zubair Hamza um, and I think the balance of the squad and, and obviously George Lind is not with us at the moment another all rounder 
burn as long as I take a moment with another all round. So I think in terms of bases being covered, I think even the composition of our squad, the 16, um, there's a lot of guys who do um, both. So, um, yeah, I think we're, we're probably set for all rounders um, uh, going forward and, and probably into the M next year's MSL. You know, it, it's an interesting point that that you brought up about specialists, and and I completely agree with uh, I completely agree with what both of you all have said about specialists. Uh, my follow up question to that is that uh, you know, with with the selection of all rounders, what what I suppose is uh, is intriguing to me is that there's always this um, there's a bit of a gulf, right, between your batting ability and your bowling ability. Very rarely do you find a player who who can who, who can be selected on on merit on on either on either discipline, and that to me is a challenge, right? Particularly because in in the world generally there's a trend that that there are more top three or top four batters compared to five, six, and seven. So how do you you know, how do you go about that? Because you just said, Kyle, that, you know, your middle order is very flexible. So how do you go about training players to become better finishers, for instance? Um, just speaking from experience this last week, we, we'll have two nets running, four batters will bat. Um, I think two of those batters in the next setup will then come bowl. And then the four guys or six guys that were bowling in the first session or bat in the second session. So it's not just a case of batters bat, bowlers bowl, and then that's our practice done. We, got, we, we swap it out. So in the first session, for example, John O'Bird and, and Wayne Parnell will be batting. Um, and myself and Avi will be bat, uh, will be bowling. We will then go bat and, and Parney will come bowl to us or whatever. And then you set, set, set um, so scenarios for that. I know I'm not really going to face the new ball. So when Parney comes on to bowl, he's probably going to grab an older ball and it's going to be a case of you're back for a couple of minutes, but then we go straight into you need 24 or 18 or it's death overs. And this is the field we're going to have. And, and that's how I, I think we would, we would train for it. But, yeah, you know, if you bowl, you will bat. Um, it's, it's very hardly a case of guys will just bring their bowling boots. Um, it doesn't happen too often. Um, and the, the luxury that we've got as well is that our coaches all throw the sidearms. So if you are a bowler and you've got your stuff there, there's always time to go face after you've finished bowling as well. So our training sessions are quite flexible yet structured, if that makes sense, that when you go into the net, you, you've got a job to do. You know what your job is to do. Epps is not going to face the new ball either. It's, that's, so we're not going to train like that, um, where someone like Tony is not going to face a really, really old ball or something like that. He's going to go up front with the new ball. Nandre is going to be charging in with, with Buren or Bash Walters, and we're gonna we're gonna train how we're gonna play. And again, that positive option is whatever we're gonna take. You might go out once or twice, and the guys are gonna give you a bit of abuse about it, or 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 have their say. Um, but we we want to play that that clever risk cricket of taking the positive option no matter what. Now, guys, there was a little bit of disruption before the. You guys started this tournament now i wouldn't call it a disruption really because i mean a, a massive loss with with Ashwell prince leaving and then fake davis taking over as the interim coach but now the news just broke before we actually interviewed you guys that salih nakadin is going to be the new coach of western province and so i just want to ask you guys your your thoughts on that um and uh are you guys maintained focused during this period and how much actually fake davis helped you guys stay focused during this period to go and win your pool at the end of the day um, I think I, I mean, I've worked with Faik for, for a long time. Um, I, we know each other pretty well. And I knew that, you know, in that sort of the interim period between Ash's leaving and us signing a new coach, um, I knew he'd be professional about it. He was exceptional. Um, we stayed preparing the way we were preparing. Um, He's a very positive, and I'm sure you've met him a couple of times. Very lively character as well, and it is good for the guys. Um, and he kept us for the most part in good spirits, and and kept our focus solely on the cricket. Um, you know, sometimes it does get a little bit difficult when things are happening, and, and you know, rumors are flying around about this person and that person and this person. 
Um, but yeah, we kept our, our you know we kept our heads down, um, prepared the way we were going to prepare, um, and there was a lot of continuity. You know, he's been assistant coach for the past three or four seasons, and so we sort of knew where we were at at the point that Ash left, and we sort of continued. And you know, as well as guys coming back, I mean, the disruption of um, players. I mean, we had players seven players abroad for most of the um, the off season, so there was always things happening. Um, and he kept critical focus on the job at hand. The task was this weekend, and you know, he was head coach for this weekend, and and he got us through that pretty successfully. And and we always knew that there was going to be announcements made. Um, and like I've worked with Fake, I've worked with Snakes as well, and um, I'm excited to uh, to work with him again. Um, he's a good man, really good career coach, um, extremely relaxed human being as well. And I'm I'm pretty sure he'll he'll fit in seamlessly. Um, and you know we've spoken as a team earlier today as well and i don't think there'll be any issues um any teething issues you know he's been a part of the setup uh, before and a lot of the guys who are here already know uh yeah <laughs> um i think i've worked with snakes once in a, in a winter camp and i think it was 2016 when i was still at Stellenbosch. um so i've, I've worked with him a little bit and i've, I've kind of stayed in touch and everything like that. Uh, obviously, when I came back to Cape Town, Ash was the person that I spoke to. Um, then I arrived in Cape Town and Faik was then in charge and now the snakes taking over. There's obviously the odd disruptions, but um, I think what we what we have spoken about as a team and as a squad, our core principles are probably most likely not going to change. Um, the squad that we've got, uh, I don't see snakes. He's not the type of coach that's going to come in and just completely change and everything. I think he's going to, he's seen what we've had, um, or what we, what we did this weekend. And I think he's going to, he's going to obviously give his little, his input. And he's definitely, I mean, they've appointed him for a reason. So we will back him and I'm sure he backs us. But for this next uh, bubble that we go into for the quarterfinals, I don't see much changing. Um, we're not going to look like a different team. We're going to, we're going to, come out and do what what we need to be doing um but it's exciting i mean he's now we like people said the appointment was coming we didn't know when it was going to come it's now arrived and, and that's something we need to deal with but i think that's just sport so guys thanks a lot for tuning in hope you guys enjoyed this episode don't forget to obviously click subscribe click the notification bell for all future videos go to the eye on the top right on the screen so that you can download the latest issue of cricket fanatics magazine every single issue is a monthly issue every single issue is free straight to your inbox every single month when the new issue comes available the guys on the screen are also going to subscribe um very soon as well uh get the the, the new issue of the magazine but yeah uh just doing some punting there and probably for the wisdom Province team as well maybe they can get onto the email list uh, but ultimately you know that's what you need to do to get your monthly fix of cricket fanatics magazine um every single month is going to be about a different theme this next couple of themes are all about t20 cricket so if you want your fix on t20 cricket that's what you have to do thanks a lot for watching everybody and we'll see you guys again very very soon with another daily show take care everyone